down there is our remarkably talented chef, Rootsworth. Honestly, he could be running the kitchens at Redwall if he wanted, but for some reason, he's content to cook for us humble scouts. Not that I'm complaining. You'll be checking in with him after you've collected everything for tonight's soup. Well, that concludes our tour of Hilltop Camp. Oh, and if you ever come across an odd pile of flat stones, just take a gander through your way glass. There may be something interesting to see you wouldn't have otherwise noticed. Now, Liam, you've got a soup to cook. Here, Rootsworth gave me this recipe for you to follow. First, you'll need to collect three beets from the garden. Beets, not radishes. He'll sort of can tell you the difference. Second, you'll need a cob of corn, a potato and an onion, all which you'll find over at the obstacle course. And lastly, a wheel of cheese. Apparently, fraby has got it over by his tent. Ah, <laughs> Fraby. Always with his cheese. <laughs> Part of initiation night is making the newest scout run around on a wild goose chase. But don't worry, it's all in good fun. Now, you better get collecting. Aren't you coming with? Uh, actually, I've got some scout business to attend to. So you'll have to finish preparing the soup on your own. If there's anything you want to talk about before I go, uh, be sure to ask me now. Um, what I understand is that uh, Freebie and Liam are good friends, but all of, all of them grew up together pretty much. Before you go, Soph... What's on your mind? I can't tell you how relieved I am to finally be a scout. I can't imagine you were nervous during your trials. My stomach felt like a brick. Oh, I was certainly nervous as well. My paws couldn't stop shaking. Tessa said she didn't notice, but I think she was just being nice. Tessa is uh, another one that was also in that half circle of uh, people. I've got to say, I've been looking forward to our feast tonight all week. Though, I sort of wish it wasn't just for the scouts. It would be nice to have Mom and Pop and all my brothers and sisters there too. Ah, oh, wouldn't it? Well, next time we see your family, I'm sure they'll throw you a feast themselves. They're always so proud of you. I know. It's a little much sometimes, actually. Yeah, overpraise. I I kind of hate it too, you know. I noticed, uh, you know, when I was in school or, or you know, any time when people overpraise me, I just sewn out after, a, you know, like... Five good jobs, you know, like, yeah, mm, mm, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking about us going to visit my ancestral home in Southwood after the wedding, Castle Flore. I have such tiny figments of memory of the place, but I couldn't have been older than an infant. Ah, I want to see it now, and I want to see it with you. Maybe we could go to the western coast. I've always wanted to smell the sea. We can go anywhere and everywhere. Can you believe we're going to be married in just three days? Oh, Sophia. I've been dreaming about making you my wife since the day we danced at the name day festival. I'll never forget the way the roses smell took behind your ear. Oh, Liam. It is rather exciting, though. Everything is going to change. Yes, it will. But it's a good change. He's a lover boy. <laughs> uh... Have a good night, my love. She's dead. Down. Uh, oh my god, he actually is able to reach. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> the demo of Act 3, so yeah, this is where we're gonna act up. We have a few sentences. Sentences. Uh, reels. Okay, never mind them. 
now I guess we're gonna have to swim. long enough to <laughs> reach where well, hold on. Now this is down. Ah, here it is. Come on. Oh, that's gonna be a... You know how to do Oh. Yeah, I just wanted to get this. actually a way to get back there, I think, if you, we run all the way around. Okay. Fine. She's on your feet. And there was something else, too. Hello. This is Robin, and the other guy that I don't know. Remember, Kayo. Ah, here's our initiate now. Glad you finally made it. Finally, indeed. The moon's full up and we haven't even started the soup. Your job is to get tonight's supper started and we'll be making soup. Exactly what kind of soup is up to you, but let old Rootsworth give ye a few pointers. Everybody has their loves and everybody has their hates. Taint no way, no how to make everybody happy. But a smart chef can usually keep everybody fed. Go do your scrounging. Come back here to see how to turn cold water into a hearty broth that'll make a badger lord weep. I trust your betrothed left you the list of ingredients. Well, go on then. They won't gather themselves. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> I'm certain a youngster such as yourself has better things to do than pester an old mouse and his pipe. Soup, you say? You're rather lucky. Your betrothed had to make pies for everyone. Oh, brilliant job, that. The best mushroom pie I've had in ages. Yeah, I think I prefer to make soup than, uh, than pies. Thank you. Oh, I do love mushrooms. Oh, but the secret to long life, and a quite excellent coat, if I say so myself, is anything hot. Give me food that's spicy and prone to set your whiskers a quiver. Hot root especially is good for the humours. Uh, Regina tells me I'm a jester by temperament, but I'm a salamander by appetite. <laughs> Funny though, I can't stand onions. or oh, hate the things. Certainly it's not typical for soup, but as you're just getting to know everyone, you should be aware that Tussa is allergic to nuts. All of them. Oh, frightening thought for a mouse. Oh. Luckily, it's nothing too serious. Still, that seems like the kind of information you might want to have. Yeah, okay, so no nuts. And let me guess, there's gonna be one guy that absolutely loves it. <clears throat> what a story, that one. In fact, a bit unsettling, if you ask me. You see, his mother had been quite barren for longer than her fragile heart could bear. And when Mr. Rushwittles took his journey to Dark Forest, it seemed all hope was lost for his line. Until the old gal showed up to high late and great with child. She glowed with pride, and despite her condition, she danced each and every tune as if it were the last song she'd ever hear. But the story took a dark turn. When she brought water afore the birch leaves had turned to gold, and her bonny child came far too soon. The midwife did what she could, which was precious little, and placed the pitiful, mewling thing in a pumpkin shell by the fire to keep him warm, but walked away weeping for the poor, weeping widow. Then, the next day, 
I was strolling by the hole and heard the widow singing and saw her dancing a jig through the window. The look on her face was a mixture of genuine joy and a fair determination. It seemed her tiny boy had survived the night and what she could do but dance in thanksgiving and in warden. The next day it was the same and the next and the next. By spring the tiny thing had tripled in size and everybody in Leegrove started to wonder if somehow the widow's mad dancing was just the thing to make a dibbon thrive. A few of the women even invited her over to dance for their newborns, as if she welded some bit of the old magic, (laughs) which of course was ridiculous. Uh, But still, there the boy is, the biggest mouse in Lilygrove, except in Rootsworth. And who can explain his unusual tale? You spin quite a yarn, Mr. Coyle. Thank you, sir. I do make the effort. (laughs) Okay, then. Coil, my bad. <laughs> don't tell me you've taken a shine to that one already, have you? I, I don't mean to suggest Framey is a bad mouse. It's, it's just that he's the sort of fellow who always finds himself in the vicinity of trouble without ever falling in. And Master Nutworth seems to think he's just lucky, but I know more than one of his mates has met the flat side of a wicket on account of Framey's luck. As an example of just this kind of thing, do you remember Tom Larchburg? The tall, skinny mouse, just a few seasons older than yourself. Uh, Just a bit. He and his kin moved away, if I recall. Indeed they did. Moved all the way to the base of Salamanderstrup, on account of something else that happened that very same autumn. Liam, my boy, I doubt you'd remember it, but there was a fire that destroyed the West Crop field of the rye-made ladies. It's a mercy that ground was fallow, or it sure have been a terrible matter. When the ashes had settled, there were Tom and Fraby, huddled under a stump in the midst of it all. <laughs> Nobody ever cast a stone, mind you, but it wasn't a week before the Larchburn clan moved west, in the hope the long patrol hares might take young Tom on as a squire, or some such, and teach him some better manners. But so far as I know, Fraby walked away with naught but a singed whisker. Wonderful creature, Tussa. Brilliant tactical mind. It was just the past summer that we were down south on an errand for Ichabod, when we were attacked by a great bulgy toad. Fearsome thing, kitted out like, like some kind of gladiator with a net and a spear. Oh, I can't imagine where he got the stuff. But there was Tusser, attacked by surprise and cleverly drawing the creature off balance, just in time for me to break its guard and disarm the monster. If it hadn't been for her quick action, I fear we'd both be worse off. I seem to recall something rather different in her report. I imagine Miss Pawsnick, being the humble creature she is, might tell the tale differently. But don't let that fool you. She fights like a wolverine, I tell you. Oh, what can I tell you about jolly old Rootsworth that isn't as plain as the book on his shirt? For one, there's a lot more to that mouse than meets the eye. He has roots that go back into the dusty corners of Lily Grove history. And the truth is, nobody really knows how old he is, where he grew up, or who his mother is. His charming father, whose story was equally veiled, just showed up one day with a son who could already walk and talk with nary an explanation. Of course, that was well before my time, so I'm only recounting the local legends. You can be sure that there's more than biscuits and gravy to Rootsworth. Mr. Coyle, you besmirch the good mouse's name. Not at all, Captain. I only add a little flair and mystery to it. Uh, youngsters like this will need their imagination set alight to breed proper awe, which is just what that ragged old beast deserves. <laughs> oh, how many more is there? <coughs> Sophia. I can find out more about her. Here, let me tell you something, mouse to mouse. There's a better chance of you playing Skittles in Marshak than you finding a better gal than Sophia. 
With every bit of good advice I have in my right paw, I implore you, love her well, and never, ever take the last for granted. Who knows what the future will hold, but I expect she'll do great things, and you'll be proud to stand at her side. And last but not least, I think, Robin. The first time I met the captain. Oh, Mr. Coyle, not this story. <laughs> yes, this story. The first time I saw him, there was an enormous stoat, dressed like a vulpine shaman and dripping with bangles and belts, sitting right on top of Captain Robin, pinning him to the turf and trying to pull his arms off. <laughs> the captain, who wasn't even a scout back then, is mourning and squeaking, and I'm certain he's about to perish, so I rush at the creature, swinging the only thing I was carrying. A huge basket of fresh raspberries. <laughs> In mid-leap, I hear Robin's back snap like a dry twig, and the berries come crashing down over the stoat's tattooed pate, like so much fresh blood. <laughs> he wasn't breaking my back, he was fixing it. I'd injured myself that spring, and the good healer was helping me with some rather vexing pain. How was I to know that? Nevertheless, the stoat slowly stands up, dripping red juice like a wounded king from some ancient tragedy, looks me dead in the eye, and growls, I thought we'd agreed on gooseberries. <laughs> okay, I thought that's everyone. Um... Of course, you know old Ichabod, don't you? He's the kind of fellow youngsters speak about in whispers, I imagine. Don't let Ichabod's rough, outward manner fool you, though. He's actually just that ornery all the way through. <laughs> uh, of course, it wasn't always so. It never is. When he lived in Honeyshire, he was handsome and strong and happy. But the tale is, the jealous and spiteful neighbours, led by the father of a spurned love, took to slander and gossip, blunting his aspirations and breaking his heart. He tried to weather the jeers, but in time he grew bitter and moved here to get a new start. And I can't say that I blame him. As such, I try my best to offer him every kindness I can at every turn, which is how I attempt to welcome him to our village. That's your motive? To make him feel welcome. Well, he also presses the finest cider in a hundred leagues, which keeps me motivated. Since you mention it, I do believe there's a letter for him in the post box. Why don't you bring it to him? All clear. <laughs> Very well. Carry on. And I guess. I see the sweet aroma of jam caught your nose. <laughs> well, if you happen to spot any more of those little wicker baskets of jam around, be sure to grab it. They've got a bit of a contest going on with the other scout corps. Right. So, Mr. Robin. Captain. Tell me more about this jam contest. It's a scout tradition to stash these baskets around for the finding. And not just Lily Grove scouts, mind you, but all the scout corps around Mossflower. At the end of each season, we compare our find to see who's got the most jam. And then Rootsworth bakes the winner the best pie you've ever tasted. Why, last spring, Coyle found so much jam that Rootsworth had to commission a special baking pan from the metalsmiths at Salamandastron. <laughs> so, if you happen to stumble upon any, be sure to grab them. We've won four seasons in a row, and I'm not about to let my scouts fall behind. It's soup tonight, is it? And I deduce you hope to discern something useful about my palate. Trying to curry favor. <laughs> curry, yes. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, if done in good spirit. I myself am quite fond of boiled potatoes. Though they are hard to come by this time of year. Liam, Liam looking the happiest ever. Looking for more? Very well, just one more tidbit and then off with you. I too must prepare. 
What I said about potatoes? As fate would have it, Rootsworth can't stand things. Finds them smackish. Whatever that means. Now use that information wisely, Initiate. After all, Rootsworth has been a great friend for many years. And he's a third generation chef for the Lily Grove Scouts. Okay, so the chef doesn't like potatoes. Potatoes, potatoes. To be honest, I don't really like potatoes myself. Unless it is uh, like new potatoes. Uh, I don't know. I'm here, I believe. So, right here. And that's Tuska. if we want to. Oh my god. Um, I have a hard time reading this. Um, although it's kind of how I write myself. Flying squirrels. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, it's the longest I've ever met. The longest I've ever met. Scout has mingled. Stuff. Stuff or stuff. information. Barely bungle weed. Very much. Hey Tuska, what do you like? Cutting wood. The one thing I can do very well. Have you not any work to do? You got cooking duty tonight. Mm. What's the plan? Soup? Twist my whiskers! For my initiation I had to make stuffed toadstools. Do you see now what I feel put upon? You are making soup. I have a request. I do ever so long for the taste of fish. Roasted tomatoes, grilled squash, cold meadow cream. I mean, they're all wondrous to be sure, but I long for something more hearty, something that, that carries all those other things, like a mum carries a wee dibbon. I see. What, was that too much? No, no, not at all. I've just never heard someone compare their food to a baby. That's all. <laughs> when you put it that way, it was too much. Our little secret. Okay, so fish, pretty much. Um. You had to ask about me, didn't you? You remember, I was always so awkward and graceless. Growing up near mice like your Sophia and Foxglove always put the jiggles in my stomach. That's why me and Cloverdown stuck to fishing. The logic of line and tackle is simple. It never changes, and there's no guessing if the day was for winning or losing. Uh, so fish. And a fuckload of other things. <laughs> uh, use your spy glass. 128 southeast. Oh, seven. Oh, there. 
it. Oops. Southeast is southeast is pretty sure. Seven. Ah, there's something over there. However I can get out there. I'm gonna get that first. Got it. That wasn't so hard. Now then, what's left? Everyone's mail. Oh my god. Geez. Okay, I cannot read this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, new auntie. Very nicely written. Still nothing I can read a little, of, right? I'm writing to let you know that you uh, have officially. that you are officially an aunt. Shed shap all the fucking time. <laughs> uh, I like to see Thanks to the red walls. In Swedish, we call this Gumlasa. Means that you're just looking over it. Like, okay, good. Gonna read it later. Or maybe not. 
and has a lot Root, Rutus or Rutus, okay. Shampo to fight, jeez, well. I think this is what we were supposed to um, give to in Chapot. A juicy red beet, fresh from the garden. Nice. Oh, is this a potato? Oh, it looks like a raisin. This is a carrot, and the shriveled one's a boot. No, I personally do like carrot. This is a carrot, and the shriveled one's a boot. Actually, some potatoes too, but you know. These will give you, uh, if I press click on these, you will get the uh, yellow. This. These I don't really understand though, he likes mushrooms. He doesn't like garlic when it looks good. I don't know what these are. He doesn't like mushrooms. Five seconds! Five minutes! Holy shit! <laughs> but yeah, probably would take five minutes for me to read it. 
appears in front of us high, but feel, but I feel like when I say hi, he should be writing with his own letter. <laughs> so we should have given him a hard time next time he writes. Actually, quite pretty damn good. I think that's freebie. Who knows? That's actually quite good. And uh, see a marker there. And uh, no idea how to actually get up there. Um. <laughs> Do it right, then uh, you know I like it. Oh. Yeah, this is the uh, the loading screen. Uh, I'll say hello there. That's Freebie and someone else that I don't quite know yet. Good evening, Liam. Hello. If you're making soup, I hope you had a little rosemary for me. I just love rosemary. Love this voice, though. <laughs> me? Not much to tell, really. You know, I'm only a few seasons older than you. But growing up, we never mixed much, did we? I suppose that's my fault. I'm not quite comfortable with other people. Crowds make me anxious. And I don't really click with people either, but you know... Kinda get more annoyed with the, you know, being around people. Like, why are you talking? Shut up. He's been a great friend. Talks enough for the both of us, which <laughs> suits me just fine. He quite likes company and crowds, always trying to get me to talk more. Speak up for myself, as he puts it. But I'm quite content to let him do it for me. People that people that talk for you can be quite annoying, but you know, people that speak, you know, for both of you, that's that's great. Uh... Do you remember that hot summer many seasons ago? When you and Bronock were still dibbons and down in the reeds, headed toward a row, one you were destined to lose as he was older, stronger and most of all a bully. Remember then how he yelped in pain and ran home wailing like a raven, leaving you whole and happy and chasing dragonflies? That was a slingstone that scuffed his skull, that was. I wonder how I know that. <laughs> Also, Lavon has a wonderful telling voice. I just, I just want to say that he has a wonderful telling voice. Yeah. Oops. Freby always says you have a nose to rival any mole. Any tips for my own sniffer? Freby is wrong about my nose. Moles have the best sense of smell by an easy league. I guess he is prone to exaggeration. Still, you're a weathered scout. Notice how scent moves with the wind over and around obstacles like stones and walls. Scent is never a straight line to its source. Wind and the world change its path. Things like flags and smoke are dead giveaways that the wind is active. If you really concentrate all of your senses, 
there's a lot you can learn. You can fence much more, fence farther and with more clarity. It's almost as if you can see right through the walls. If you find yourself in a tight spot, always use your nose and who knows what you'll learn. Best I not distract you. Busy night and all. I feel a little bit of personal connection there, you know, look. Yeah, yeah, you, you talk for the both of us. I just like to, you know, be on my own. Doesn't like talk too much. And, you know, honestly, I don't know what to say. If someone comes up to say, hello, I am more prone to, prone to say than anything at all. I see what you're looking at, and since it's a special night for you, I'll forgive the offence. Uh, pardon me? No you don't. You don't get to play dumb. But it is alright. This once. I've been short my whole life, and I'm quite accustomed to the secret looks, the hidden snickers. Oh, I've endured them all. But I won't accept that kind of treatment from another scout. Hmm. We respect one another round here. It's part of the scout code, so I expect you to abide. Now, take your pouty glare and make another approach. Uh, tell me something, uh, and be honest now. Do you think I talk too much? Uh, because somebody who shall not be mentioned told Laban that I talk too much and asked how he could bear it. It got me thinking, that's all. I don't think I talk too much. But it's hard to really know when it's yourself. Do you can? The first rule of stealth is easy enough. Don't be seen. But vermin don't react instantly. Keep a weather eye on your enemies, and you'll get a sense of their awareness of you. The closer you are, the faster they react. But you'll always have a moment or two to recover stealth, in case you're caught by surprise. The second rule of stealth is like the first. Don't be heard. When you're sneaking, you're almost silent. When you're on a scurry, you can be heard a long way off. And of course, the ground you tread upon makes a mighty difference as well. Silence and slowness are kissing cousins. Like being glimpsed out of the corner of their little beady eyes, a single noise won't alert a rat immediately. You'll have a precious moment to recover if you stay perfectly still and let the moment pass. If you make a mistake, freeze and watch your enemy closely, in the hopes they go back to ignoring you. Did you know that when a rat hears a suspicious noise, it'll start moving towards its source? So, a wee thing, like ourselves, can use sound and decoys to our advantage. It'll get you thinking it will. Imagine the possibilities! <laughs> the third rule of stealth is the hardest to control. Don't get scented. But Laban has his own lesson on noses and nostrums, so I won't bother you with such things here. Just be sure to be aware of your own scent at all times in the wild. If there was a fourth rule of stealth, which there isn't, it would be to work your environment. Use what's available. Be clever and alert. Be like me. <laughs> and while fighting a vermin toe-to-toe -to -toe isn't always possible, using your wits to stay safe is always a good choice. Use cover to your benefit at every possible turn. You can see out, but they can't see in. Oh, it's fantastic for spying, but uh, it's also often uh, quite noisy. So stay cautious and slow. Uh, Laban likes rosemary in just about anything, even just a nibble on a stem when he's walking about. Uh, uh, come to think of it, there used to be a healthy bush of the stuff near the hot spring. But he can't stand cabbage. Don't even think about that fermented stuff. The big mouse will practically run screaming at even a whiff of it. And you? The soup is fine. I always like something warm in a cold night like tonight. <laughs> but what I really love is a nice bloomy cheese. Alright, she 